quick big thank you to the Genealogical Society of Ireland for inviting me here to speak this evening. And it's great to see so many familiar faces in the audience. So um, I very much appreciate you all being here on this wonderful summer's evening when you could be at home cutting the grass. So you know it needs to be done. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is really uh, DNA and Irish genealogy. Where are we now and where are we going to? So it's a little bit of a look at where we've come from and a little bit of a look at where we might be in the next five or ten years because I think uh, uh, there's been some, some really interesting advances in the science over the course of the last, even the last several weeks and I'll be talking a little bit about uh, those events and how they have implications for us going forward. Now, uh, as my role as Education Ambassador for the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, uh, part of my task is to, to take relatively complex topics and make them into digestible, bite-sized chunks for the average member of the public. So that's very, very much a part of my role uh, as uh, Education Ambassador. And what I'm going to do during the course of this uh, presentation is to touch on a lot of uh, things, a lot of activities and events that we are doing within Ireland that is advancing the science of genetic genealogy. So there are various genetic companies that you could do the DNA test with, and I'm sure uh, many people here have tested with uh, uh, some of these companies. It started off uh, in 2003 with Family Tree DNA um, and uh, the Genographic Project, and then later on 23andMe joined the Foray and then Ancestry DNA, and then there was a company called Britain's DNA, which also had an offshoot Ireland's DNA and Scotland's DNA, but that is now defunct. And in its place, we have companies like Living DNA, which has been around for about three years or so, and uh, My Heritage DNA. So the, um, the face of genetic genealogy is changing. And um, there are three main types of DNA test. I'm just going to come out of there and go into uh, this here so I can actually playing things that I don't want it to play. Uh, slideshow, and we don't want that. So I have to untick those, and then go back there. So, yeah, so there we go. So there are three main types of DNA. Uh, the Y DNA goes back along the father, father, father line. The mitochondrial DNA goes on the other side of the family tree, back along the mother, mother, mother line. And the autosomal DNA is uh, the, the test that covers all of your ancestral lines. But it has a limited reach of about five, six, or seven generations. So that will take you back roughly uh, to a connection with, common, uh, with cousins with whom you share a common ancestor within the last 250 uh, years or so. So going back to about... 1750, 1700. So that's, and that's the most useful test from a genealogical point of view. The Y DNA test and the mitochondrial DNA test are good for recent ancestry, but also deep ancestry, going all the way back to genetic Adam and genetic Eve 250,000 years ago in Africa with the appearance of the first anatomically modern humans. And because of uh, the reach of Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA, they've been very, very useful for human migration studies and studies about how human beings have populated the planet. But of course, they're not particularly relevant for genealogy, which for us means going back into the 1800s, 1700s, and maybe even a little bit further if we're lucky enough. Now, this is a, 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 di a, a, a screenshot of my Y-DNA results, and this is what you see with, with all of the tests. You have a list of matches here, and then uh, here you have the most distant known ancestor. Oops, I can blow it up a little bit uh, there just to show you that this particular one uh, down here says Thomas Gleeson, 1822 to 1887. Boherlahan, Killamakil, and that's in Tipperary. That's the single most important piece of information that you can supply if you're doing a Y-DNA test. Because the uh, conglomeration of all of these in a, a surname project will help identify where the genetic group to which you belong came from originally. And I'll show you a, a couple of slides in that regard. Um, there are over nine, th now on its own, your results on its own, don't tell you a huge amount. It might tell you people that you are closely related to on that particular father, father, father line. But when you join a surname project, 
That's when you really get the most out of your uh, Y-DNA results, and there's over 9,400 of them on Family Tree DNA. And of course, a lot of these surname projects are uh, to do with Irish surnames, uh, because the people from Ireland went and populated the whole planet, and we now have an 80 million strong diaspora all over the world, 40 million of that in the US. And a lot of people in these surname projects will be US-based, because that's where these uh, databases started off in the first place. Uh, and currently there's about 608,000 Y-DNA records in the Family Tree DNA database. Now I run the Gleason DNA project uh, with uh, my co-administrator Judy Klassen. And in this project uh, we have a display of all the members' results in this fashion. And the most important thing about this very busy slide is the pretty colours. And the reason why those pretty colours are so important is because you see a pattern. And that pattern is a genetic pattern. So imagine that these, these are all the members here. Imagine that their Y chromosomes are all stacked on each other. And all along the Y chromosome you have these markers. These are the marker, marker names up here. And uh, they're all lined up in a row. And the various values for each marker are in these uh, columns here. And you can see that there's a kind of a, a column that stands out there. Another column that goes all the way across this particular group uh, here. Another one here. Another one here. That's lineage one. This one is lineage 2, and you can see that the coloured pattern is completely different. Any, and that we also have a third lineage, lineage 3, and again you see that the coloured pattern, the genetic signature, is very different compared to lineage 1 and lineage 2. So it's this uh, similarity of the genetic profiles that allows us to group people together. Um, if you match the genetic profile of lineage 2, I can say with 99% confidence that your Gleason ancestors came from North Tipperary. Because uh, all, a lot of the members in <coughs> Lineage 2 have uh, recorded, recorded their most distant known ancestor as coming from Tipperary. If you uh, match the genetic profile of Lineage 3, I can say with 99% confidence that your Gleason ancestors came from West Clare. And if you match Lineage 1, I can say they came from Cockfield, Suffolk, in England, and not only that, your most distant ancestor is probably Thomas Gleeson, who was born there in 1609. And the people in Lineage 1 are New England American people. And uh, this just goes to show the kind of a population explosion, founder effect you get, when a single immigrant comes in to America and he has lots of descendants who have lots of descendants. So anybody in Lineage 1 uh, can go back not just to a specific place of origin, but a named ancestor. And that's an incredible power of DNA to do that. Now there's other groups within the project. This is a US group. We're not sure where they came from. Um, and then there's a group of ungrouped people. And you can see that this is a hodgepodge of different colors. There's no specific genetic signature <coughs> in these people who have not been grouped as yet. They don't have another genetic match in the project at this point. So that's um, the Gleason DNA project. And this is uh, <coughs> exemplary of other DNA surname projects. Uh, these can help group people together, firstly. Then uh, the DNA can identify a person's origin. And it can even help identify a person's ancestor. <coughs> So that's the power of uh, DNA, and of course, over the course of the last 15 years, these surname projects have matured, and a lot of them now are at the level where uh, we are able to write up uh, the, uh, the findings, and uh, they are linked, a lot of the genetic groups are linked to specific ancestral places, and even in some cases, like in lineage one, it can go back to a named individual. So doing a Y-DNA test, and having uh, these kind of matches almost gives you your genealogy served to you on a platter. It certainly tells you where to look and where to continue your documentary research. Um, like I said, it also helps us with uh, the uh, study of uh, population migration movements. And we've also been able to put together the tree of mankind, starting with genetic Adam and uh, going, uh, uh, dividing the tree into the various branches that split away. 
and that's by studying these minor mutations that occur in the, D the DNA every couple of hundred years. And then over the course of many, many millennia, we find that we're able to generate this tree of mankind. Uh, this is an example of how many of the branches there were just in haplogroup R, which is the most common genetic group within Western Europe. And from 2002 up until the present day, the number of branches has increased so that uh, now we have um, more than 5,000 sub-branches below haplogroup R. And that is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the more, that, more people that actually join the various surname projects, the tree of mankind is now coming down, sufficiently far downstream, that is actually going into the surname projects themselves and we're actually seeing sub-branches within surname projects. So for example, in the Gleason DNA project, um, I'm lucky enough to have a sufficient number of people in lineage two, the North Tipperary Gleasons, that I have been able to um, date the beginning of this genetic group to roughly about a thousand years ago, which is about the time that surnames started in Ireland. So, um, I've been lucky enough to date that, and now there are sub-branches coming down, so there are about 11 major branches of Gleasons within that North Tipperary group. And each of those branches goes down to perhaps a particular townland. Uh, some of them went off to, uh, the, the, elder, the oldest pedigree we have is, goes back to 1600, and that was from somebody who was an indentured servant and ended up going over to the US. And the surname there changed from Gleason to Plesson. C-L-E-S-S-O-M. And you wouldn't have thought, just by looking at the surnames, that these two could possibly be related. But when the DNA came back, he was an exact match to one of the most ancient branches within our group. So it's very, very interesting the way that this is evolving. And uh, over time, what's going to happen is that certain DNA markers will become associated with certain locations. And those locations will be associated with certain surnames. And those surnames may very well tie in to the ancient genealogies, just like we have in Yarrow Morn and Anelach, um, and um, what other ones? Uh, uh, O'Farrell's uh, Linea Antiqua. Uh, Bartiaski has done some great uh, tables of all the medieval uh, lineages. And of course, we have O'Hart's um, uh, uh, The Origin and Stem of the Irish Nation. So uh, it's very, very interesting time that we're entering into now because as the surname projects uh, mature, we're getting more information that perhaps ties us in to these ancient Irish genealogies. So uh, that's a very exciting uh, place to be. And I think over the course of time now, we'll see more and more of these um, Irish sets and clans being associated with a specific genetic signature. We've identified uh, the genetic signature for Brian Baru. And uh, we've identified the signature for Nile of the Nine Hostages, um, whether he was mythical or not. Uh, we do have a, um, a signature for the O'Neills, the E-Neill. Turning to autosomal DNA, which is the most popular of the DNA tests, uh, it can tell us about our ethnic makeup. It can put us in touch with genetic cousins. It can tell us a little bit about our medical risk. If you test with 23andMe, that's the only company that does that and it can tell us what percentage of our DNA is Neanderthal DNA. Because back in the day, we interbred with the Neanderthals, going back 40, 50,000 years ago, and we actually carry some of their DNA within our uh, genome today. Um, as, as far as ethnic makeup is concerned, it used to be a case where it could just tell you 10% uh, of your DNA is from Europe, 20% of it is from Asia, and 70% of it is from Africa. So it was just on a continental level. But then as more people joined the databases, as the uh, algorithms for calculating ethnic makeup were improved, it became uh, possible to just do it on a sub-regional level uh, within a continent, and then even down onto a country level. And now we're at a sub-country level. So you see, this is my um, genetic makeup on Ancestry. And they have a feature called Genetic Communities, which was introduced in March of last year, uh, just, just over a year ago. And you can see that I have a big uh, swathe of DNA from Southern Ireland and another swathe of DNA from the North Midlands. So this is going to become more and more precise 
and it'll, it will drill down onto a much more granular level as we do more analysis of the DNA that's coming in. Uh, Living DNA, for example, have used the data from the People of the British Isles project, and this is uh, the type of um, uh, division that they get uh, geographically and genetically, and they're planning to do the same kind of thing in Ireland, so that we're going to get something like this, that the different areas of Ireland will be genetically mapped. So you'll be able to do a DNA test, and on the basis of that DNA test, they'll be able to analyze it and say, 10% of your uh, DNA comes from the Cork Kerry or Southwest Ireland area, 20% uh, comes from the North East Ireland area, and um, about 50% of your DNA comes from Mayo, and another 10% from, from Galway. So that's the kind of thing that they are aiming to provide, and that will happen in the next uh, couple of years. And of course we know this is possible because of the great work done by the Genealogical Society of Ireland in collaboration with the Royal College of Surgeons, and of course that was the Irish DNA Atlas Project, and our good friend <coughs> Gilbert has presented here previously on the project, and he's also talked uh, for the last three years at Genetic Genealogy Ireland in the RDS uh, every October. And um, the, the results were published uh, this year in one of the Nature journals, and you can see that this is the type of pattern we're getting for autosomal DNA within Ireland. And it's defining some, some very distinct genetic groups which are geographically circumscribed. So we're seeing a little bit of influence of the, the, the plantation of Ulster. We're seeing uh, some divisions that perhaps correspond to some of the ancient Irish clans and the territories that they moved in. So this is very, very uh, exciting and it's something that will continue because we're still recruiting for that project and it will continue uh, for the next couple of years, and, and congratulations to Seamus and the team for such a great uh, job. In fact, let's give them a round of applause. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you go into your, um, your results, whether it's on Ancestry or 23andMe or Family Tree DNA, um, it's, it's very user-friendly. You get a list of your matches. Here you can see that I've got a first cousin match, a second, several third cousin matches. And then you just click on the view match and it comes up with this type of um, uh, diagram which shows you uh, their family tree. It shows you, you can click on shared matches to see what matches you have in common with each other. Uh, if you click on the little uh, I button up there, it tells you the amount of DNA that you share with that particular individual. Um, the same sort of thing with 23andMe, uh, again, these are the, the list of matches, these are the people that I, I match, some of them are third to fourth, these are all third to fourth cousins, these are the third to fifth cousins, and you can send them a message, and basically it's all about collaboration. Um, you just have to say, I, you know, I see you and, and me, we are match on our DNA, would you like to swap pedigrees and family tree information and see where we connect? Um, same thing on family tree DNA. These are a list of my matches here. This is the total amount of uh, DNA that I share with them in Centimorgans. And I can click on the uh, email button over there and that puts me in touch with them and we can collaborate on trying to figure out how we are connected genetically. Um, there's also this public database GEDmatch. And um, this is where you can download your DNA data from whatever company you've, you've tested with and you can upload it to this public database which allows people from different companies to compare their DNA with each other. Because obviously the different companies don't have access to other companies' database. They don't talk to each other. You have Ancestry doesn't share its information with Family Tree DNA or with 23andMe. So a couple of uh, volunteers from the genetic genealogy community set up this database so that people could uh, upload their data to the database for comparison between companies. And we'll be talking a little bit ab about that later on because there's currently 800,000 profiles in that database and it has become an unusually powerful <coughs> tool in ways that we might not have imagined a few months ago, but a couple of weeks ago, several things happened that have made us kind of sit up and take notice and I'll be talking about those. The secrets of success as far as DNA is concerned, is to have an online tree, if at all possible, um, to collaborate one-to-one, -one, 
initially, and then maybe in small groups. Um, and remember that DNA is just a pointer. All it's saying is that you and you, you're related to each other, now go away and find out how. And then you have to go back to the documentary records to see if you can find common locations, common surnames, and eventually a common individual in your respective trees. So you don't have to be technical with DNA. You don't have to get involved with the technicalities of DNA to actually make it work for you. Because it's just a pointer, and at the end of the day, you just have to swap pedigrees. So if someone says to me, oh, hi, Morris, I see we're a DNA match. It's on chromosome 12. From this, I say, hold on, hold on. I don't need to know the technicalities. Here's my pedigree. Do you notice any common locations, common surnames, common individuals? Because if you do, let's chat. If you don't, thanks very much for getting in touch with me, and the best of luck with your genealogical research, because we are back to square one. There's nothing that we can do. Um, we could try to collaborate in a small group to see if a group of us match each other, and we both sh all share the same DNA, then maybe as a group we could do that. But if it's just one-to-one, -one, um, you can't do anything more if you can't identify any common locations, individuals, uh, surnames or individuals. Um, one of the things that you can start doing when you work in groups, and it can be just a group of three people, is triangulation. And triangulation has been in, uh, around for a long time. Uh, you can see here the uh, definition in, in Wikipedia. It's been used in trigonometry and geometry for centuries. And all it means is you have people, like these people here, in modern times, that's us, looking back at a distant point, that's your great-great-great-grandfather. So that's all triangulation is. It's looking back into the past from the present and trying to triangulate on a specific distant ancestor. Now, I did this inadvertently in my own family tree. So this is me here. These are my siblings. There's my dad. And uh, if you go back along his, uh, one of his ancestral lines, back up to his great-great-grandparents, uh, Patrick Spearin and Mary Morgan, I found that I had, uh, without planning it, I had tested uh, three of his cousins, all of whom are descended from the same ancestral couple. So all of them had DNA passed down to them from Patrick Spearin and Mary Morgan. So this got me thinking, and I thought, any people, any matches that they share in common with each other could very well uh, have had the DNA come down, come, have uh, got DNA from the same origin that uh, above Patrick Spearn and Mary Morgan that passed the DNA down to these four cousins here. So what I did was I compared A with B, A with C, A with D, B with C, B with D, C with D, and I put together a list of a hundred shared matches who could have received the same DNA from uh, the ancestors of either Patrick Spearn or Mary Morgan. We, we can't tell at this stage whether it was on the Spearn side or the Morgan side of the family. But, to cut a long story short, after two years and writing a hundred emails to people, um, somebody sent me the notebooks of Professor Wardell, Professor of Military History, Trinity College Dublin, in the 1910s, who had done a study of the Morgan family and had gone into the public record office and used all those wills and all those primary sources that went up in flames in 1922 and had written about it in his notebooks. And there were my great-great-grandparents, Patrick Spearin and Mary Morgan, and he also gave me the place of birth of my great-great-grandfather, Patrick Spearin, which I never knew of before. But not only that, the Morgans actually came from a very well-to-do family. And he gave me five generations of Morgans going back to Limerick in the 1600s. But not only that, there was a link to the Morgans of Tredegar House in Wales. And they were a rowdy bunch, and they got into a hell of a lot of trouble over time. And they had a lot of money, and they spent it. And I am related also to this chap here, <laughs> who was Sir Henry Morgan, governor of Jamaica. I'm also related to this chap here. Any ideas? JP. JP Morgan. And I'm also related to this person here. 
<laughs> There's her Morgan ancestors, and it comes down via her mother's mother's side. So that was a huge surprise. You know, I am apparently, and I do have to check the sources, but I am apparently the 11th cousin of Princess Diana. Which made me joke, you know, see you at the wedding in May. <laughs> <laughs> and I was at the Irish Georgian Society St. Patrick's Day party in London, and I was telling this story to the lady I was sitting beside, and she said, oh, that's a coincidence, because I have a plus one. So I almost got invited. She said, oh, but you're traveling in Australia, so you can't come. So um, I almost got invited. I could have seen Ed Sheeran live. Um, so you never know what... Um, DNA is going to open up for you, and never in my wildest dreams would I have thought that I would have gone back to Wales in the 1600s, and then down to Captain Morgan, um, J.P. Morgan, and Princess Diana. So it's opened up a whole new avenue of research for me, and it's going to keep me busy for a long time. So that's one of my retirement projects now, one of my many retirement projects. Um, within Ireland itself, we have actually come a long way since 2003. Uh, we have set up um, our own Ireland branch of the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, and we have a Wikipedia page that summarizes Irish DNA projects, autosomal DNA projects as well. Um, it lists uh, project administrators working within Ireland. It also has uh, an account of some special interest groups, talks about genetic genealogy Ireland, and a variety of other things, including the various meetings uh, going on around Ireland during the course of the year. Uh, we've also included um, a commentary on the adoption bill and help for Irish adoptees wanting to use DNA. So, um, whereas we started off working one-to-one, -one, we've now developing into the situation now where there is actually a group of people who are working towards similar goals. Um, Genetic Genealogy Ireland started in September 2013. These were the three days of DNA lectures that we'd have in um, the RDS at Back to Our Past. And they've become very, very successful. In fact, currently, um, oh yes, we, we've, we've put all of the uh, videos up on, on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel. And uh, you, these are all free to access, so it's a service to the community. And currently, up to the 6th of May, there have been 200,000 views of these videos um, for 2.2 million minutes watch, watched. <laughs> and if you were to do that on your own, it would take you four years and 69 days. So that's pretty impressive. Um, the audience you can see is largely American. 60% from the US, 7.6% uh, from Canada. 11% in the UK, 7.5% in Ireland, and 5.2% in Australia. But this is a wonderful way of illustrating how we are reaching the Irish diaspora. And it's a great way of pulling them in, and a lot of people are actually traveling over from America to specifically go to the DNA lectures at the RDS. Which are, it's really a piggyback conference, because Back to Our Past was already organized, and Family Tree DNA were very uh, kind to sponsor a, a lecture area where we could give uh, lectures about DNA um, and uh, genealogy. So that's proved very, very successful. Um, uh, we also did a 27-page commentary on the adoption bill last year and um, met with the uh, Department of Child and Youth Affairs just to impress upon them how DNA was going to revolutionize the way that adoptees approach searching and tracing for their birth families. And they were very receptive to that. Uh, we also have a, a, a help area for Irish adoptees wanting to use DNA. And um, last year we trained 45 social workers uh, who work with adoption agencies all over Ireland in uh, what DNA is and how it can be used to help adoptees. And more and more now we're actually being referred uh, adoptees who uh, want to use the DNA route try and find their birth families. So that's a, a development that we wouldn't have foreseen perhaps a few years ago, but now the uh, adoption agencies within Ireland are actually referring clients to us for this type of work. In terms of where the future is going with autosomal DNA, I think autosomal DNA projects are going to become hugely important. I was down in uh, Mount Bellew at the weekend. Uh, there was a genetic genealogy conference there, and Martin Curley who organized it, also organized the, or helped organize the commemoration activities 
for uh, 33 uh, young women who left Mount Bellew Workhouse in 1852 on a bride ship to Australia. Um, it took them five months to get there. They thought the ship had been lost, and then finally, two months late, it turned up, and they uh, got married in Australia. All they left <coughs> Ireland with was their the hurley chest, which had two pairs of shoes, two dresses, several petticoats, and that was their future in Australia. And the descendants of some of those women came back to Mount Bellew at the weekend for a very uh, emotional uh, commemoration, and now there are thousands of descendants of these women in Australia today. So it was very, very moving to hear some of the accounts. Kieran Cannon, the Minister for the, the Diaspora, gave a very impassioned uh, speech on uh, how, we, how important it is to connect with the diaspora. He himself has done his um, uh, DNA testing and very proudly comes back as primarily Connacht genetically, um, uh, which you'd probably worry about if he didn't. And um, uh, he was very a, a great propon uh, proponent for DNA testing. But this is where I think it's going to go, is that we're going to have much more of these autosomal DNA projects where people uh, join the project and we'll have networks of connected people, people who are connected by autosomal DNA. Uh, currently, we have various projects in these places here, but a large swathe of the country still remains to be covered. And so there is a wonderful opportunity now for any budding project administrators in the audience or listening on YouTube uh, to actually take on uh, local projects where we can create these autosomal DNA networks. And that's connecting the, the people within the locality in ways that they had not imagined previously. Irish academia has also been involved in a lot of advances recently. We have the Irish DNA Atlas project, which was a seminal project, very similar to POBE in the UK, and uh, the two of them have pooled the resources to produce some of the wonderful maps that you see in those publications in Nature. But we also have had some great work done uh, at the ancient labs in Trinity College Dublin and in University College Dublin. And uh, one of these was the discovery of bones under a pub on Rathlin Island. And the amazing thing was they still were holding their pints and they hadn't spilt a drop. Um, but this changed the way that we actually thought about the, population, the populating of our country. And this work was undertaken by Professor Dan Bradley of Trinity College Dublin. There's the, the paper there. But he used whole genome sequencing, which was a novel and revolutionary way of analyzing the DNA. Because the tests that we do, uh, they test about 700,000 DNA markers on our autosomal DNA. But the test that Dan has done tests 3 billion markers on the entirety of the DNA. So it's, it's a... It's, a, it's a, an order of magnitude more granular than uh, the test that we do. And that caused a minor revolution. Um, one, of the, one of his colleagues over in Harvard, uh, Professor David Reich, is actually developing a method that may even be cheaper than the forensic methods that are used to do this similar type of test. So that's a, a, a great way of introducing the future in terms of ancient DNA. It is rapidly advancing and keep your eyes on this spot because more is to come. And so far they've only published the results of four of these ancient skeletons uh, dating from 4,000 to 6,000 years ago. There are approximately another 20 to 40 skeletons yet to be analyzed. So it's going to tell us a huge amount about ancient Ireland four to 6,000 years ago. Another very interesting project that was done for the 1916 commemorations was the identification of Thomas Kent. And this was done by the lab at University College Dublin. Uh, Jens Carlson was the person that spearheaded it. He presented the uh, results of Genetic Genealogy Ireland, and you can um, uh, view them on, on the Genetic Genealogy Ireland YouTube channel. Um, but the techniques that they used for the identification of Thomas Kent were innovatory. These were the, uh, the first this is the first time that such techniques have been used, and it cha will change the way that people approach this type of identification, because they also used whole genome sequencing, which was not something that is generally done in forensic situations. 
But uh, this just goes to show that between Trinity and UCD, Ireland is in many ways leading the world when it comes to these rapid advances in ancient DNA testing. We also are now faced with the social applications of DNA. And uh, one very pertinent example was one that I talked about at the weekend, and that was the mass grave at Chewham. Uh, and it's been known to exist there since the 1970s. And this is the 796 children found in a pit um, uh, below the site of the former children's home, the former mother and baby's home at Chewham. Um, it was discussed in 2014 by Catherine Corliss. And the question is, are these 796 children buried in the mass grave that has been known since the 1970s, and the locals have put up a, a memorial garden uh, because of that. Um, so this was the, 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 the presentation I gave on Saturday is available on YouTube. So you can see that on my YouTube channel, DNA and Family Tree Research. That one there. If you just Google YouTube and uh, DNA and Family Tree U Research, you'll find that. And um, how can DNA help at Tume? Well identification of individuals, the reunification of bones <coughs> that have maybe scattered over, over a, 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 um, several uh, meters uh, within the pit, and the discovery of trafficked children, because there has been this question raised, were some of the death certificates forged, were uh, some of the children in fact sold to adoptive couples in America? So if that is the case, and several people have come forward asking that question, is it the case that my sister, who is supposed to have died in Tume, is was actually adopted and she's actually alive and somewhere in America? Uh, if that's the case, they, all they have to do is do the Ancestry DNA test, download a copy of the results to their computer, upload those results for free to all of these uh, websites here, Family Tree DNA, MyHeritage, Living DNA, and JetMatch. And if the uh, sister or the sibling is not found uh, in any of those databases, <coughs> then the fifth database to check out is, that be the sixth database, is 23andMe. They can test with 23andMe. And that way they actually have access to 15 million people, one of whom might be a child who was trafficked from Chile, if trafficking indeed took place. But there are some people, like Peter Mulryan of the uh, Tune Home Survivors Network, uh, is very concerned that that is the situation with his sister. So this is the sort of thing that anyone who is worried about that can actually do. And this is a social application of DNA. This is how we... And it's the same technique that we use with adoptees who are trying to find lost parents, lost uh, half-siblings. In terms of identification, and this doesn't just apply to Tume, but it applies to any situation where you find unidentified human remains. So it could be feasible to do this with um, anybody, a Jane Doe, a John Doe, um, an unidentified person that's found in, in, uh, at the side of the road and you don't know who they are. So it has forensic applications as well. Um, first of all, they need a tissue sample. And of course, the tissue sample that we give will be living DNA, so it'll be a cheek swab, or it'll be a sample of saliva. It might even be a blood sample if you're at the, at the doctor and you're doing a genetic test to test for a medical condition. But with deceased people, it's usually um, a tooth, for example, like they did with Richard III, or the petrous bone, uh, the, the, temp the petrous portion of the temporal bone, which is just that area of hard bone behind your ear. And of course, it's called petrous because it is like rock. It is the densest bone in the human body. The yield of human DNA from ancient samples is about 58% from the petrous bone <coughs> compared to about 10% from any other bone in the human body. So, and this was a, a, a technique that was promoted by Professor Dan Bradley and Trinity College Dublin. Um, and that's just where the petrous bone lies within the human skull. The second issue regarding uh, this type of activity is the quantity and quality of the DNA extracted from the tissue sample. Now, uh, for us, doing a cheek swab or giving a, a sample of saliva, um, some of you may have heard back from the lab saying, oh, there wasn't enough DNA in your cheek swab, please can you do it again? Uh, so that happens also with ancient DNA. You might try to get and extract DNA from a sample, but there may not be enough DNA to analyze. And that's always going to be an issue. 
And as one of the problems of tumour, we don't know if we will be able to get enough DNA from, these, uh, from the bones of these children. Uh, the second problem, of course, is that uh, the DNA that you get from deceased people is degraded DNA. As soon as we die, our DNA starts degrading and fragmenting. And the, the, the longer it has to degrade, the more it fragments. Now, it's interesting that um, we're still able to get DNA if the environmental conditions are good enough. And dry, um, dry, cold conditions are the best. So that's why when these archaeologists go into a cave and they find bones in the back of the cave, they've been able to extract DNA from Neanderthals from 38,000 years ago. And that's why we know whether or not we have Neanderthal DNA in our own genome today. Because they've been able to sequence Neanderthal DNA from bones that were 38,000 years old. <laughs> Compare that with the case of the Titanic, which only happened 100 years ago. And in 2001, they exhumed the graves of three unidentified people in Nova Scotia. Two of the graves, there were no human remains left because they had been waterlogged and the water speeded up the, de the degradation process, so there was nothing left in those graves. There, were, there was a bone left in the third grave, and they managed to get a DNA sample from that, and by doing that, they were able to identify the unidentified child that had lain in that grave for 90 years. So, it's environmental conditions rather than the age of the bones that is most important in terms of whether or not we can get good quality DNA from the sample. Secondly, uh, well, when we go on to DNA testing, there are three types of DNA, Y, mitochondrial, and autosomal, as we've said. There are two types of DNA markers. So you can get some tests looking at STR markers, some tests looking at SNP markers, and there are three approaches. The forensic approach, which uses only a very small number of markers. For example, the Y-DNA test for forensic science is 17 markers. The one that we use in our genetic genealogy goes up to 111 STR markers or 85,000 SNP <coughs> markers. So it's a magnitude uh, greater than the forensic uh, approach. Um, ancient DNA, they're currently using the whole genome sequence. So instead of doing 17 markers, they're doing 3 billion. So that's a huge order of magnitude uh, different. And more and more, I think, the techniques that are being discovered by the likes of Dan Bradley and Jens Carlson and TCD and UCD, those whole genome sequence techniques will filter down to the commercial tests like Ancestry, Family Tree DNA, and also filter down to the forensic tests as well. And that means the future is going to be a very different country to where we are now. In terms of DNA for comparison, you can either use anti-mortem samples, in other words, a sample <coughs> tissue from the same person um, that was taken before they died. Very good case is the case of Anastasia, Princess Anastasia. Um, she, uh, they didn't know whether the person that claimed to be Princess Anastasia was an imposter or was the real princess. And after uh, she died, uh, ten, 10 years or so later, they dug up the uh, Romanov family and um, they were able to get an old sample of tissue from the alleged Princess Anastasia that when she had undergone <coughs> surgery, they contacted the hospital, got the old sample, compared it to the uh, Romanovs and also to Prince Philip, uh, who is related to them, and showed that she wasn't Princess Anastasia. She was, in fact, a, a woman called Anna Anderson who had, uh, who was, who had mental health problems and had for many, many years claimed to be Princess Anastasia. We can also target individuals like they did at Fromel and like they did with Richard III, where they looked for relatives supposed to be descended from Richard III and compared their DNA to the DNA of the skeleton in the car park in Leicester, and that proved to be a match. And they did the same thing with Fromel, where they had 250 World War I soldiers. They contacted um, the families of 1,650 soldiers got DNA samples from all of them and compared them against the 250 soldiers they found in the mass grave. And so far they've identified 159 of the 250 people. And then there's general populations such as forensic databases like CODIS or um, public databases like GEDmatch, which is the one that we use in genetic genealogy. So the last step then is to establish the identity. This will never be absolute. All we can give you is a probability. 
um, it may be as, as high as, well, in the case of Richard III, 99.9994% probable that it was Richard III. In the, in the case of Thomas Kent, they came to the conclusion that the likelihood ratio was 5 trillion to 1, that he was relate, that the, 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 the bones they found were related to the nieces of Thomas Kent, than not. So 5 trillion to 1. Uh, so that's the kind of statistics that are needed. Very recently, four weeks ago, five weeks ago, uh, this broke in the news. And this was the case of Buckskin Girl, um, a murdered 21-year-old girl found in Ohio in 1981. Um, for 37 years, um, they could not identify her, despite the best that forensic science could throw at the case. But it was taken on then by the DNA Doe Project, which was set up by some genetic genealogists. And they managed to extract um, from uh, DNA from a 37-year-old blood sample from 1981 that had never been refrigerated. So they managed to get DNA from that sample. And they run, ran multiple profiles through the analyzer. And the, um, uh, the short, uh, long and short of it was that they were able to uh, get between 50 and 75% of the um, SNP markers that were used by direct-to-consumer companies. Then a spoof kit was created by Greg Magoon, and all this meant was that they, they extracted the DNA markers that we use in our genetic genealogy tests. So now they had, and it was like an Excel spreadsheet, downloaded into an Excel <coughs> spreadsheet just those markers that were relevant to genetic genealogy. Then they uploaded them to GEDmatch, and the typical um, kit for this buckskin girl uh, was about 500, 500 to 600,000 SNP markers out of a possible 900,000 that GEDmatch could deal with. Uh, heterozygosity index was 19.5%, and, a half and uh, the no calls with 35%. So they got about two thirds of the DNA and were able to extract about 50 to 75% of the relevant DNA markers for comparison with everybody in GEDmatch. So they uploaded it to GEDmatch, compared that DNA profile from Buckskin Girl against 800,000 profiles, and they got a first cousin once removed match. And they had the email address of this person from GEDmatch because it's public. They looked for that on Ancestry, found a corresponding tree, and within four hours, they opened up one of the members of the tree, which said, missing, presumed, dead. So after 37 years, Buckskin Girl was identified within four hours of the upload of her results to GEDmatch. And that just goes to show how powerful the combination of DNA and genealogy can be. Now, um, her mother was contacted because she'd never changed her address, she'd never changed her phone number, and she was always hoping that one day her uh, girl would call her. So the take-home messages are that there have been major recent advances in DNA technology. Um, autosomal DNA extraction is possible from ancient samples, and sufficient SNP profiles can be generated for comparison uh, with samples from living people, whether that is targeted relatives like Richard III and Mel, or with the general population like Buckskin Girl was done with Jetmatch. The approach is very similar to that done by the commercial direct-to-consumer companies and GEDmatch. You just take uh, DNA from a, uh, uh, certainly for, for Chum, for example, you could DNA, uh, take DNA from a prospective family um, and compare that against the entire database of uh, DNA from the remains in the mass grave. And you just could see if there's a match, is it a first cousin match, a sibling match, that type of thing. And um, identification is possible. So identification of remains is possible, and it's becoming more and more possible as the technology advances. There are, of course, ethical issues, and I'll just deal with the last few slides and then I'll throw it open for questions. Before qualifying for DNA comparison, um, people uh, in relation to Tume must have reasonable grounds to expect to be related to one of the children in the mass grave. But what are reasonable grounds, and where do we draw the line? Do we draw the line at first cousins, at second cousins, these are ethical questions that nobody knows the answers to at this point in time, and there needs to be discussion to see what we as a society are, are happy with. Um, and then what if some family members want to do the test and other family members say, no, we don't want anybody to do the test, how do you resolve these conflicting desires? 
Is there a case for identifying all the children? Do all the children deserve to have their name on their gravestone? Possibly yes. Uh, do their families deserve to have their privacy protected? Possibly yes. But how do, how do you then balance these conflicting um, desires? Uh, could the identification be done without publicity? Again, possibly yes. So there's all these possibilities, but we need to find through this, 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 uh, um, this uh, array of different <coughs> desires and wants, what is the path that causes the least potential for harm and the most potential for good? And that's a huge question that we're being left to answer now. Um, so using GEDmatch to identify these children, we could generate spoof kits, upload them to GEDmatch, just like we did for Buckskin Girls, and um, the identity of the child could be deduced, and then a specific family could be targeted for confirmatory DNA testing. Um, just so you know, this is GEDmatch, these are my matches here, there's the kit numbers, this is the amount of total centimorgans, these are the names and the email addresses, um, these are partially pseudonymized, this database is run by two volunteers. We also have the Shared Centimorgan Project, which is based on 25,000 known relationships and the range of DNA shared for each of those relationships. So we get an average and then a spread on either side. So that's based on 25,000 uh, people. It's been generated by the genetic genealogy community. We also have it made into a, an online tool, a DNA painter, and you can put in the amount of DNA and it'll tell you 100% probability that that's a sibling. It'll tell you 100% probability it's a nephew or a niece or maybe a grandparent or a grandchild. It'll tell you 97.5% um, first cousin, 2.49% one of these relationships here. So the, the take home message here is that probabilities for each relationship can be calculated statistically and that makes it even more uh, feasible to actually identify these children or indeed identify anybody uh, in a mass grave situation or in an unidentified human remains situation. So DNA has certainly come a long way since 2003 and it's changed the practice of Irish genealogy. Um, it is now really a routine tool in the toolkit for the Irish genealogist. It's, we have established a strong global presence um, thanks to uh, a huge number of Irish surname projects, um, also establishing the signature of some of the clans, which has really attracted a lot of people to DNA testing. There's been cross-fertilization between academia and citizen science, um, spurred on by events like Genetic Genealogy Ireland, and also facilitated by our own ISOG Ireland group. And then we have had academic uh, studies like the Irish DNA Atlas, the work at the Ancient DNA Labs, which has informed the work that we do in the genetic genealogy community. And as far as the future is concerned, I think autosomal DNA projects will, will become much more important over the course of the next several years. The social applications of DNA and genealogy combined, that's going to mushroom. And that's going to raise a whole load of ethical dilemmas that will spark continuous discussions of the ethical issues as they arise. So one thing is for sure, it's not going to be boring and the future is going to be very exciting for genetics and genealogy. Thank you.